Grief is a thin place, a place so thin it's hard to tell where earth ends and heaven begins. Grief is a place so thin that it's where the living and the dead feel one another's love. I'm Lisa Hamilton, an Episcopal priest, and I grieve. First, I'll read some scripture that many Christians use in worship during Lent, and then I'll struggle with those words through the lens of grief. I'm glad you've joined me. Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 2. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. When Inga and I visited Assisi, Italy, we were astonished. Inga is my only child's godmother, and we made a pilgrimage together over the week of the first anniversary of Ted's death. Ted was creative and kind and was getting ready to return to college, where he would change his minor from art to psychology, having found his way at last. He was going to be a therapist. But two years after he stopped using heroin, he still had nerve pain. And so he took Imodium sometimes to relieve it. But one night he took too much and his brain died. A week later he became an organ donor, as his driver's license said he wanted to be. There was one room available in the jumbled little town in the Umbrian Hills the week we visited Assisi. And when Inga reserved it, we had no idea that its window opened up to a view of St. Francis's Basilica. But it did, and it felt like all the life of that place poured into our window. From early in the morning through evening, people came and went, some alone, some in groups, some trudging and downcast, some following guides who held flags aloft. The basilica's huge, round, rose window is placed over the smaller one like a beacon, and the bells toll a welcome that echo over the hilly countryside. Like the basilica, our hotel had been built in fits and starts, and although we were on the top floor, it was hard to tell if that was the second or the third floor. We stood looking out our one window at the enormous sandy pink church in front of us for a long time. And that night, we would notice that it shone white in the moonlight. Neither of us could think of anything to say, which is unusual. But finally, the only thing to do was to go down the musty hotel stairs and walk across the cobblestone road to St. Francis's Basilica. There's a long gravel path to the basilica, and it swept us toward the arches topped with a small rose window and through the bronze doors, and we were there. While Inga plopped down in a pew and pulled out her rosary, I made a small donation to the Franciscans who run the place, and I gave them two names for masses, Ted and his dad who died when Teddy was barely two, my first husband, Scott. It wasn't an easy transaction because neither the friar at the welcome desk knew much English, and the only Italian I know is what you find on a menu. There was a sign we could read, though, because it had English among its languages, and it directed us downstairs to a midday prayer service in the simple chapel housing St. Francis's tomb in five minutes. We rushed through the upper church knowing we could linger later at fresco after fresco, but it was like hurrying through an art history book. I bought slender white candles in memory of Ted and Scott to be used at some point in worship at the Basilica, and Inga saved me a seat. The service was simple and moving. Maybe because it was in Italian, my mind didn't get tripped up on the words, and I felt some of the first rays of peace I'd known since losing Ted. 
After the prayers, true to form, Inga and I got lost. If you've ever been in St. Francis's Basilica, you probably understand. There are chapels and aisles and huge nooks with sculptures and the walls and ceilings are covered with masterpieces of frescoes. And the tomb is probably the plainest place in the massive church. I can't remember what we were looking for, maybe just a way to get back upstairs. But I saw the back of a friar. He was walking faster than my son Ted usually did, but there was something about his build, his gait, and of course, the curly reddish hair. And so in that dim light, I asked him for directions. He turned around and the cord tied to his brown habit swung, bearded like Ted, but with a British accent, and very young. He led Inga and me to a quiet, sunny nook, <laughs> and the beard on his pink face was sort of a surprise. While Ted's hair had been reddish, this guy was a true carrot top. Turned out his name is Joseph, and we can't remember if he was 19 or 20, but he confided he was relieved to speak English as he was struggling with Italian. Inga explained that we were in Assisi because Ted had died a year ago that week, and for a moment, Joseph froze. I don't think he knew what to say. But in a minute, he said, follow me. And he led us in another direction, where he pointed at an enormous fresco with several spots chipped away by age and earthquakes. Joseph pointed to Mary. She was wearing a deep blue robe like usual, but her pose was unusual. In this fresco, Mary's eyes are meeting her son's as he hangs on the cross, and she has a gaze you wouldn't dare try to hinder. Jesus is so far beyond his mother's grasp, but still, there is a bond. She understands, Joseph said. Let Mary be your mother. I stared at Mary in the fresco for a long time, and I noticed she was surrounded by people. One woman is actually holding her up. And there's another arm around Mary, too, but so much plaster is missing that you can't tell who it is. Inga put her arm around me and held me up as we stared at the art, weeping together. For an instant, we were part of the fresco, and so was Ted as it's written in Alice in Wonderland. How long is forever? Sometimes just one second. Grief is a thin place.